So even before we get to the pre-initiation stage of transcription factors binding to the cis regulatory module, there's actually kind of an even before step, which is whether or not the chromatin is actually open and available for transcription anyway. So this is the before pre-initiation stage of transcription. <laughs> okay, so we've looked at chromatin structure before in chapter two. Things like we have our DNA molecule, which is wrapped around a nucleosome, and the nucleosome has these four highly conserved histone proteins, pairs of each, so we get a little block of eight, okay? And then those nucleosome particles are coiled up into the chromatin fibers, and then that's wrapped up into the chromosomes, okay? Not too worried about the diameters or anything, but um, let's know what a nucleosome is, okay? So we've got our nucleosome bead, okay, which has the eight histone proteins, and there's it's H2A, H2B, H3, and H4 are the four histone proteins, and that roughly about 146 base pairs of DNA wraps around those beads. Okay. So uh, now we're talking about what we've previously referred to as heterochromatin and euchromatin, which has fallen out of favor, which is great, and been replaced by closed chromatin, okay, here, and open chromatin over here, okay, sort of relating to whether or not it is available for transcription factors to bind to, okay, and so the relative spacing of these nucleosomes with respect to others affects cellular functions, including whether or not transcription can proceed. If everything is closed up and tight and there's not any open available DNA, then there is not going to be a whole lot of transcription going on. Uh, if they are open, expand, the nucleosome particles kind of slide open and you get these strips of open available DNA, then you're going to have more gene expression occurring there. So let's look a little closer at these histones in, that are within the nucleosome. Okay, So you open it up, and there's these kind of beads. There's two molecules each of each particular histone. They're paired up. And what they do is there's these, these little kind of the nut of the uh, um, histone. And then they have a little tail waving off. And the DNA kind of, uh, the DNA kind of wraps around these spaces. And so the tails are generally not in contact with the DNA specifically. But these tails on the histones are made of their chains of amino acids. And so these amino acids are available for chemical modification. And what happens to if there's something stuck on these tails will influence whether or not the DNA near those tails can be transcribed. Okay. How we talk about uh, where these histone modifications occur, there's a specific uh, way of doing this. So here's our histone protein which is, and we look at the, they list the tails first. Okay, so let me put that in there. So this is the tail is what's sticking out. And then this end over here is the actual like ball. Okay. And so if we look at say uh, histone 2A, because we've got histone 2A, histone 2B, H, histone 3, and histone 4. Don't ask me about histone 1. <laughs> um, we can find, if we look at histone 3, and we look at residue four, K4, okay? So this is the lysine residue in fourth place, and it has one methyl group attached, okay? So when a methyl group attaches to this, we call that particular modification this name. Uh, let's do another one. So like H3S10, okay, is a phosphorylation um, that occurs when cells are dividing. Right? So there's um, different things that can be done to all these. So some of these particular residues are get um, added a methyl group, so that's methylation. They can get acetyl group called acetylation. They can get both methylated and acetylated on the same residue, or they can get phosphorylated. Right? So different, different chemical reactions occur to these histone tails. So a little more up close. So here is the acetyl, the different groupings. Okay, so we can have an acetyl group form which generally forms on the lysine residue in the histone tail. Okay. A phosphate group can pop on, and that's found, those will attach to either the serines or the threonines, the S or Ts. Okay. And then we have methyl groups 
And we can either have, um, there can be none or one, two, or three methyl groups popping on each of these on the lysine residues and the arginine residues because of availability of bonds. Okay? You can also get um, a ubiquitin tag okay, that tells the, um, that protein should come and degrade this particular section of, of, um, uh, of histone amino acid. So it may be um, uh, that it's broken or there's a homology directed repair or something going on. But you can also, you can also be tagged for degradation. So this in a nutshell is really what epigenetics is all about, is whether or not uh, DNA is available to be um, transcribed or not based on these particular um, histone residues here. So like this particular one here, uh, if it's present, the gene is silenced, and if the gene is active, you won't find it. That's a sort of epigenetic tag there, silencing or activating genes. And different genes will have the, what I would call like a histone code. They'll have certain patterns of methylation or acetylation on certain residues on these. It's not touching the DNA itself, but it is these are associated with the histones that the DNA is wrapped around and conjacent to. Conjacent? I like that word. Okay. Uh, and they'll be, you'll see them at certain particular places on the genes. So these are on, not on the gene itself, but they're on those little nucleosome balls where this particular DNA is wrapped around. Okay. So different locations you upstream of and within the gene are enriched for particular modifications, okay? And then not every nucleosome at that site is going to be modified in the same way. But this is basically the, the idea behind epigenetics is there's another layer of regulation on top of transcription factors and interactions with the DNA itself. In this case, this is the, the methylation of the histone protein and also some methylation of the, um, the gene itself, what we call a a uh, CPG or a CG island that can be directly methylated on the DNA. You can get a methyl group latching onto the, um, in this case, nucleic acid uh, bases. But we'll get into that a little further on. So the last piece we have here is uh, the role of the mediator complex, which I've referred to a lot. And is, has to do with whether or not, and it relies on whether or not the chromatin is condensed or, or decondensed or, or open. We'll stick with closed and open. Um, and that when the gene is all tightly wrapped up like this and it's condensed or closed, that we're not going to have any transcription occurring. But uh, then when we have these loops, okay, it starts opening up and we get these distant binding sites together. So we have sort of maybe here's like a minus 100 upstream base pairs. And here is, a, you know, this might be 400 base pairs upstream. But the chromosome actually loops around and these areas get in contact with each other based on the transcription factors latching onto those sites. Okay. And those transcription factors latching onto the mediator, which then helps form the protein complex around the mRNA polymerase. And now you can finally have your mRNA start to be um, produced.